So my daughter just recently went off to university. And as she was in the process of trying to figure out what university or college she should apply to, what program she wanted to go into, what basically she wanted to do with the rest of her life, it occurred to me that it's a lot more difficult today to figure it out. Because with all of the change and the disruption of technology, a lot of the jobs that people are going to end up in, the careers they're going to end up in, they don't exist yet. They haven't even been invented yet. That's a computer from the 70s. Moore's law says that processor speeds will double every 18 months. This basically means that computer power will double every 18 months. And keep in mind, as technology is getting more powerful, it's also getting a lot smaller, and it's getting less expensive. And this has been true since 1965. This is the world's smallest computer today. There is computer technology that's smaller than this, but this is considered the world's smallest computer because it has full processing capabilities. It's less than the size of a grain of rice, and it can do full inputting of data, output of data. It can process data. It could basically run Windows, and it supplies its own power. This costs $110. So we've gone from, in 35 years, we've gone from this huge computer to this tiny computer. This big computer that could do less than my smartphone can to a tiny grain of rice that can process and run Windows. To this, which costs $10,000, to something that costs $115 all within 35 years. I wonder what the next 35 years will bring. Imagine what you could do with a computer the size of a pin hat. In a few years, they expect that computers will be powered by atoms, which means that they'll be able to shrink down to the size of a pin hat. What could you put that into? You can put it into almost anything. And in fact, <coughs> nanocomputers are currently being injected into the bloodstream of leukemia patients. Harvard University started an experiment in 2015. Basically, it's really hard to treat leukemia because the drugs that kill leukemia also kill the good cells. But these nanocomputers can be programmed to travel through the bloodstream and attack only the leukemia cells. Have you seen Snapchat's new glasses? They're called spectacles, and they'll allow you to be able to take a 10 second video of the world exactly the way you're seeing it. So picture this. I'm at my son's hockey game. He's got a breakaway. He's skating up the ice, and he's about to score the winning goal. And I can record that exactly the way I see it. In a few years, you won't need those glasses. They'll be able to take a microcomputer the size of a pin head and embed it directly into my eye. And that computer will be running Snapchat as an app. It'll be one of the many apps that it's running. So all the apps that are currently on your smartphone will be able to run off that microcomputer that's embedded into your eyeball. Glenn Beck predicts that by 2045, humans will be able to upload their entire brains into computers. So can you imagine if we could have uploaded Einstein's brain into a computer? We'll also be able to download information from computers into our brains. So picture this. I want to learn how to drive. I download it into my brain. Poof, I now know how to drive. Ray Kurzweil predicts that in 90 years, biological parts of the human body will be replaced by machines. He 
he believes that we will indeed need a body. We need some kind of vessel for our intelligence to be directed towards. But they don't have to be these frail bodies that are subject to failure mode. Virtual bodies will be as detailed and convincing as our bodies are today. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Glenn Beck and Ray Kurzweil lead artificial intelligence engineering at Google. They can predict the future because they're currently working on it. So how does this make you feel? Are you a little bit concerned? Maybe a little nauseous? I am. It makes me concerned. But this is not my concern. When all of this is going down in 50 years, I'm going to be in a nursing home getting my ass wiped by a robot. This is your concern. So, in the face of all of this change, I tend to worry. I worry for the future. And one of the things I worry about is how all of this technology is affecting our brains. Did you know that how we play shapes the future development of our brains? It's all to do with building neural networks. So if I play a lot at the playground on swings, there's actually a connection. The neural networks that I develop doing that, there's a connection to my ability to do math later on in life. When I was a kid, I loved Lego. I played tag. I played at the park a lot. And these things that I did as a child, they built neural networks to shape the brain that I use today. Today, kids play on computers a lot. They use calculators and they Google stuff. And it's not just kids. I almost never memorize anything anymore. I just Google it. And I don't type anymore, I voice to text. And I'm ashamed to say, but I don't even know my mom's phone number anymore. So I worry about what this is doing to our brains. I can tell you the exact moment that I stopped worrying about this. My daughter, she was about seven at the time, and she had her friends over and they were playing Minecraft on the couch. And picture this, three little girls sitting there with their tablets, and they're all playing Minecraft. And I walked by and I was about to give my daughter crap for being a bad host, when I heard something pretty spectacular. I heard, hey, why don't we put the couch over there? No, it'll catch on fire, the fireplace is over there. Why don't we move it over here? And by the way, let's make it blue. Okay, but where does the sauna go? Because we have to have a sauna. And I realized that they weren't ignoring each other, they were playing together. In fact, they were learning to work in a group. They were learning negotiation skills and teamwork. They were finding compromises and being creative. They were problem solving. And I realized that maybe it's okay if kids develop different neural networks than I did, because quite frankly, they're gonna need different skills in their future. So, what are the skills we need to develop for future jobs? 47% of the jobs today are considered at risk of being automated in the next 20 years. Low skill and low wage jobs will be the first to go. This means that going to college or university, developing a trade, developing skills will become even more important than it is today. But we're not all going to be out of jobs in 20 years. The jobs are just changing. So, Pilots will go from flying planes in an airplane to 
build control centers. Hospitals will become virtual. In fact, I may not even need to ever go wait for an hour in my doctor's office at some point. They'll be able to manage me through my computer system and they'll have just received my health metrics from my smart wearable device that emailed them to her. Did you know that Larry Page, the founder, one of the co-founders of Google, is currently working on a flying car? That's what Uber has to worry about, because that's what's going to replace Uber. And the demand for engineers and logistics professionals is going to go through the roof. And in case you think that this is some like distant, crazy thing, they're predicting that this will be ready in 2026, so roughly 10 years from now. And most of you will be able to afford it because they're expecting it's going to cost $120,000. Moore's Law means that change is inevitable. We have more opportunity than anybody has ever had in the whole history of the world. So speaking of the history of the world, you'll notice that from 1200 to 1900, the real capita per person really didn't change a whole lot. And then, in the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution hit with the invention of the steam engine. Machines essentially could help humans do the work that they used to do. So Malcolm Gladwell will say that if you were born sometime in the late 1800s, you won the birth lottery. Well, we've won the birth lottery too, because now we're in the technical revolution and it's going to be a hell of a lot bigger than the Industrial Revolution was. We tend to think of disruption as something really big, like Steve Jobs big, or Elon Musk colonizing Mars. But it doesn't have to be a big idea to be disruptive. I believe that the biggest, most disruptive ideas are actually the simple ones. So for example, Think about the person who figured out to put wheels on a suitcase. That disrupted a whole industry. This generation is better equipped than any other generation to be disruptive. You're not afraid to challenge the status quo. You expect change, you embrace change, and you question things. And there is so much more left to be invented. So why is it that when I go shopping, there isn't a solar powered air conditioner that's cooling my car while I'm out? Why is it that I have to own a snowblower and a lawnmower? Why can't there be an Uber for that? Because I just want to borrow it. Why is it that I have to move my clothes from the washing machine to the dryer? There's so much left to be invented. So what's the best way to prepare for a future that doesn't yet exist? Play. Develop your creativity. Build new neural networks. Challenge the status quo. Ask why. And then go out and invent your future. Thank you. Thank you.